Niger Delta should be one of the most prosperous regions on Earth. 50 years of oil production has earned the Nigerian government hundreds of billions of dollars in oil revenue. But instead, the Delta is ravaged by violence and its people are impoverished and angry. A region the size of England, the Niger Delta is littered with violence and gas flares. The offshoot of oil extraction, whose roar and heat can be felt for hundreds of meters around. These flares have become a symbol of the Nigerian Delta and of its paradox. It's where you find one of the richest oil producing areas in the world alongside some of the poorest people. And these people blame the fallout from the industry for their ill health, for the destruction of their environment and their unemployment. In Africa, they call it the curse of the resource-rich country. Oil revenue collected by the government leaves little incentive to encourage other industry, nor does it create a climate where democracy can flourish. For 90% of the people of the Delta, there are no jobs, and politicians feed the violence by paying armed gangs to procure the election results they want. Far from enriching the people, the experts argue oil is corrupting them. First of all, it has uh, created a disincentive for working on other aspects of the economy. So you have a monocultural economy and everybody is just you know, struggling to see what you can get out of the oil. It's broken down the relationship between you should have between effort and reward. People make money you know, all of a sudden and you can't quite see the trajectory of how they made their riches. So it doesn't encourage anybody to work in a systematic way towards making money. These days, the streets of Port Harcourt, the city at the heart of Nigeria's oil industry, are relatively calm. Compared to a year ago, when locals were killed in crossfire between rival gangs, even today, foreign oil workers are still being kidnapped. While in the region, we were obliged to travel with an army escort. The number of kidnappings is down thanks to the new joint task force set up by the government to restore law and order and reassure the oil industry. They patrol the streets day and night, set up roadblocks and search for weapons. Please can I see your boots and your inner light, which is already on. An operation which is welcomed by the law-abiding majority. We are grateful that reasonable members of society like you are happy with what we are doing. We are, we are, we are very happy. Extremely, extremely, very, very happy. We are winning to a greater or lesser extent in the sense that through this process of snap, stop and search operations, we have been able to recover many, many illegal arms and ammunition in circulation. But as the colonel in charge admits, urban operations alone don't tackle the root of the problem. Most of the illegally arms are being imported through the creeks of Niger Delta. We try to saturate the creeks block all the entry points through maritime, constant maritime patrol. The Niger Delta might be blessed with the world's best quality oil, but for the security forces, it's a nightmare to control. 50% of the Delta is made up of water with thousands of creeks in which the gangs can operate with ease and effect.
locals and foreign workers alike fled for their lives from this installation on Bonny Island after the armed gangs issued death threats to anyone collaborating with foreign oil companies. By far the most daring recent attack was here on the Bonga oil platform. Operated by Shell and located over a hundred kilometers offshore, it was thought to be safely out of reach. As gunmen sprayed the platform with machine gun fire, it went into automatic shutdown and it took weeks for full production to be resumed. It took us as many weeks to negotiate a meeting with a man who led the attack, the self-styled General Boyloaf. It involved giving our army escort the slip and a dawn rendezvous with a boat. Then a three-hour journey through the seemingly unfathomable creek system of the Delta to get to the general and to his boys in training. Media savvy and proud of their attacks on the oil companies and the forces of law and order, they put on a show. General Boyloaf tells me that he and his men can move freely around the creeks. But why did he go out to sea to attack the Bonga platform? We really want to prove to them that that nowhere is untouchable. That was why we, we visited them. That's to prove a point to them because really the Shell Petroleum uh, Development Company and also Chevron, they all of them are moving offshore because they have been disturbed in the swamp. So we really visited them to prove a point to them that nowhere to hide. The Joint Task Force, which has been mobilized by the government to combat the gangs, invited us out to watch their show. Stopping and searching all boats capable of carrying barrels of oil, and those who may just be providing cover. They don't have much effect. The gangs can steal up to 200,000 barrels a day. It's called illegal bunkering. They break into and siphon oil out of the pipelines which run close to the shore. Most of them were born in this region. They were there when the pipelines were being laid. So they don't really need to get the information from the, 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 the employees. They are, they are indigents of this general area. So they know the location of the pipelines. All they just do is go there, vandalize the place. Okay. But the task force is ill-equipped for the challenge. They've managed to seize only a few of the barges which ferry the stolen oil to huge tankers waiting offshore and take it onto the world's refineries. It's a huge and sophisticated operation on an international scale. Even the head of Shell in Nigeria, renowned for his laconic style, admits his concern. A huge concern for the communities who live there because uh, most of this illegal bunkering is a source of major pollution uh, out there, so that certainly is not what they want in their lives. Uh, it's a major issue for government to lose revenue. It's a major issue for the state government to lose revenue. You recall that the president of Nigeria, uh, on two occasions now, has called it blood oil, similar to blood diamonds, and, and really saying it requires international collaboration to resolve this, and I, and I think I agree very strongly with that. I want to tell you that they are also good, probably, engineers. 
An officer of the task force explained what they're up against. When the gangs can't get the oil out by sea, they transport it by road. Thousands of these vehicles have been seized from the smugglers. When official oil exports here in the Delta dropped by 25% last year and helped push the price of oil to new heights, the British Prime Minister offered military aid to the Nigerian government to tackle the problem. I will hope that uh, the assistance from the British government will come in form of training of our special forces and uh, equipment, uh, boats and ships also. Uh, that will help us a lot in achieving a lot of results. They're unlikely to get what they want. Human rights groups reacted in horror to Gordon Brown's offer, pointing out that it's often the politicians themselves who arm and use the gangs for their own political purposes. The offer has now been scaled down to training help only. The announcement of help from the British government had one dramatic result, though. In retaliation, the gangs operating in the Delta called off a temporary ceasefire. Uh, the message I have for Gordon Brown is to tell him that any person supporting the Nigerian state to oppress the people that have the real resources must surely lose their fight. You understand? Because we believe in the gods of the land and the almighty God. No matter the parasitas, the amenities they bring from the uh, United Kingdom and all the rest, we don't give a f about them. But we want to assure them we will surprise them. We will make sure we chase them back. You say you're the champion of the local people, but what are you doing for them? If I will try our best, as much as we can. The general was a bit vague on this one. He didn't let us film their headquarters where we saw a water treatment plant, a generator, air conditioning and a fully stocked bar, luxuries unknown to the majority of local people. It's what makes joining the gang such an attractive option for the young and what persuades many that development here in the Delta is vital for the violence to end. At dawn the next day, back in Port Harcourt, we arranged to meet with a leader of one of the so-called host communities who live among the oil wells and flares. They don't stop people getting on there like we can pass. But when they see people like you now, they will see like how uh, they, will want to, they, will go, they want to believe that we are kidnapping you. And if I reassure them that you're not? They will not agree. They will not agree. He'd planned to take us by boat to visit his village, but couldn't. There was an unusually high presence of government gunboats in the area that morning. Perhaps they'd heard of our plans, he suggested. They don't want this negative publicity about their country, their communities and everything. First and foremost, the communities are not developed. If you look at, if you look at the water the communities drink, you will cry. You need to go there and see the water. I tell you, you need to see the water with your own eyes. You need to see the water. And this, there's no water there. There's nothing is working. But I can't get there. You can't get there because of the gunboats. I'm sorry, you need to go there and see. Later that day, we had better luck getting to the host community in Ogoniland, a region that saw hundreds of people killed in the 1990s by the Nigerian military during a campaign by locals against the oil company operating there, Shell. It was an era when the idealists prevailed. We are going to demand our rights peacefully, non-violently, and we shall win. Yeah. The Agonis, led by writer and environmentalist Ken Zarawiwa, pleaded with Shell to clean up and develop their homeland. Wiwa and eight fellow activists were executed on the order of the Nigerian government. Relations between the locals and the oil company broke down and Shell hasn't operated in Agoniland since.
Shell tell you there are no more serious environmental problems here in Ogodi land. On the ground, it looks and smells rather different. I last visited the area just after the execution of Ken Sarawiwa. Then the people told me of their complaints of oil pipelines running through their villages and hundreds of oil spills which contaminated the land and polluted their drinking water. Little appears to have changed in Nagoni land since I was last here 13 years ago. Oil spills continue to destroy the environment and when the people ask the government and the oil companies for basic facilities like health care and education to compensate for the destruction of their environment, they continue to be disappointed. If anything, on this visit, people told me that the environmental damage had got worse. They gave me pictures of the most recent accident a defect in one of the pipes left here by Shell, which resulted in a spill in one of the creeks of more than 1,500 barrels of crude oil. Local contractors were sent in to fix the faulty pipe, but two months later, Shell say they still haven't been able to get to the site for a proper cleanup. Oil still covers the sand and the water, making fishing here impossible. This latest one has caused more, more damage to our lives than, e than ever. We have not experienced this type before. It is all over. 80% of the people of this community are fishermen. They don't live on any other thing than fishing. If you go across, you see them parambulating in the river because they have nothing to do again. They come back, they don't have fish again. Shell say that they and their contractors are afraid of coming back here into Agoni land to clear up. They should not be afraid. They should bring foreign companies. Let them come and do the clean up. We will be by them. We give them our assistance. We will support them for the clean up job. We are not, we don't, we are, they are not our enemies. It's just that their attitude to things like this made them to, made people to hate them. Trust me when I tell you this is what happened. It is not easy to get to site. It has to do with all sorts of things. Who owns the property, the spill is? Who is going to claim compensation? How much of, of compensation? Do people want to negotiate compensation even on times before they grant you outside society. Why should compensation be a big issue when 80% of the people in Bodo depend on fishing for their livelihoods and they cannot fish now? I think we are spending too much well, time on this, really, <laughs> to be frank with you. I think we are the spending pictures of this are absolutely shocking. You're, and asking, it does... you're asking very good can, questions. Can, can, so, mm -hmm. can, can we take it to social? She's asking very good questions, but these questions if you don't put it in perspective of what happens on the ground, it's the right question an outsider asks. Yeah. But what happens on the ground is different. Both sides blame the other, and like everything here, truth is obscured in the murky waters of the delta. An outsider like myself can be sure of only one thing. Only here, in the Niger Delta, could a spill of such magnitude be left for so long without a proper cleanup taking place? <laughs> Shell claim that local saboteurs are responsible for the majority of oil spills in the area in order to make false compensation claims. Sabotage and criminal activity can only be halted, local leaders say, if the people have a stake in the industry. Ledamiti, now the Agoni leader, has been invited by the Nigerian government to report on what the peoples of the Delta want from the next era of oil exploration. He's asking for a share of the wealth and consultation. Does he think they'll listen to him? When you look at the costs uh, of the crisis, the consequences of failure of any intervention, and the hopes of many people, many people believe that this is the last chance that they have. Um, and many people are just expectant. If you look at all that, then you feel that perhaps the government has no choice than to do something. Would the head of Shell Nigeria call it a crisis? Industry in crisis, yes, from uh, a security perspective, as everybody knows. 
uh, there are issues in the Niger Delta around um, militancy, crude oil theft, illegal bankering, all those kind of issues that has created a sort of crisis environment which, you know, together with uh, all stakeholders, we are on the table to find ways to resolve. And for the crisis to be resolved, those with an overview argue that the people of the Delta region must become stakeholders. If they know that they have a stake in the performance of the oil industry and that their, 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 their livelihood, their income at the end of the year will rise and fall with the fortunes of that company, I think they'll be more committed to helping the, uh, protecting the environment, securing the environment for that community. And it, it will also improve their own lives and um, give them a sense of benefiting from the oil industry rather than what we have had in the last 50 years. At the end of the day, it's the federal government which allocates the share of oil revenue to the people of the Delta. The Ministry of the Delta was set up a year ago to resolve the crisis, but so far no new initiatives have been announced. For the time being, guns on both sides will continue to exchange fire on the creeks of the Delta. And the communities who live at the heart of the oil producing region will continue to wonder what good oil has ever done for them.